Hey, Bo. Yes. We're not talking about Burt Reynolds. Pooper, baby. No, he's Pooper, not, no, baby. He's not part of the show. Pooper, he's, he's, baby. He is just because he was on the short list to be Superman in 76 yeah. and doesn't mean that he makes the list. Burt Reynolds. Sorry he's dead. Burt Reynolds love count. Burt Reynolds has two connections outside of that lame Superman one that you had. Yeah. One was All Dogs Go to Heaven, and that's not even comic books, but I, I grant you animation and fantasy. So, okay. And the other was Hooper. Which he co-starred, yeah. and I'm using that term loosely, co-starred with Adam West. Yeah. He played Adam West's stuntman. Yeah. Hooper was a Hollywood stuntman. That's where they stole the idea for the Fall Guy from. Mm-hmm. And within the confines of that movie, they were making a movie that he was stunting the lead for, yeah. who was Adam West, which, who was which, playing a James Bond character. Yeah. So and that is the closest connection he has to comics. Make me look good, Hooper. You come into my house to tell me about the future. That the future is tape, videotape, and not film. It is amateurs and not professionals. I'm a filmmaker. That's why I will never make a movie on videotape. I gotta barbecue your ass in my Oh, shit. Oh, you should put that speech on tape. He pulls a knife, you pull a gun. He sends one of yours to the hospital, you send one of his to the morgue. That's the Chicago way. Hello, Chicago! Hello! Hello! Welcome to Alternate Reality. There's a career, man, he was on top of the world in the early 60s, hell, mid-50s through the very late 60s. He ran CBS practically, and he's doing he's doing Sheriff Buford T. Pusser at the very end of his career. You know, I, he, he did uh, nothing in common with Tom Hanks. That was actually his last film. But before that, the big thing he was known for was doing Buford J. Buford J. Pusser. No, no, that was Walking Tall. No, 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 he was the sheriff. He was sheriff smoking. Buford? No, no, that wasn't his name. What was his name? Yeah, I don't think he had a name. Yeah, he had a name. Well, I wasn't Buford. Well, you got a phone, Richard. Look it up. Okay, after a quick trip to Wikipedia, Buford T. Justice. Wikipedia. Buford T. Justice. I'm sorry, I mixed my Bufords up. Buford T. Justice. Buford Pusser walked around with a big stick. <laughs> man, talk, yeah, okay, but man, talk about a guy who was on top of the world, and he wound up doing that crap for, I'm sure, a hefty paycheck. Well, that, and he was old, and he wasn't working much. He more or less been retired. Hey, folks, Comic Book Man here. Welcome to the Alternate Reality. I'm being joined today by... Buford T. Justice. Buford T. Justice, by the one and only film scribe himself, yes. Bo Cephas. How are you doing, kids? Burt Reynolds is a guy. And this is going to be a much too quick follow-up on our episode 80 In Memoriam episode. Our first In Memoriam episode, that one where we talked about Harlan Ellison, Big Van Vader, Steve, Steve Ditko, who all died within about a week of each other. Very close. As they say, it happens in threes. Celebrity deaths happen in threes. And I wasn't planning on this being a regular thing, but we're at the point where it's time to do another in memoriam. And I'm not really looking forward to doing these because they're actually kind of sad. These people are gone and they're no longer with us. At the end of August, beginning of September, we had three comic book creator deaths that all sort of stacked up one on top of the other. And we're going to talk about them in this episode. As always, you can uh, stop off at the store for Alternate Reality Comics, which is located at the intersection of 111 and Kedzie, beautiful downtown on Greenwood. Alternate Reality, raw new comics are always 15% off every day for everyone. And if you want to talk to us about these folks, if we're around, you know, feel free to. We're going to be covering the passings of Gary Friedrich, Marie Severin, and Russ Heath in this episode. And I want to start off with Russ Heath because... He probably is... He's the oldest of the bunch. Well, he's the oldest of the bunch, and he, he was actually the first in this series to pass away. He died August 23rd, 2018. The other two died uh, shortly thereafter. But he would probably be the best known for not being well-known out of this group. And we're, we'll get to that in a minute. Russ Heath was a comic book artist. Uh, he was born uh, August 23rd, 1980. His father was a cowboy, of all things. Yeah. 
and he was self-taught drawing and he went to high school and he was heavily influenced by western artists at the time uh will james was one charles russell was another he was a senior in 1945 and he either graduated quickly from high school or he dropped out of high school probably in order to join the air force and fight in World War II. And he fought at the very, very tail end of World War II, but he was in there. After getting out of the Air Force in 1945, he tried to get a job in drawing. Like I said, he grew up cribbing art drawing stuff from other artists. Homage. Um, Homage. Charlie Russell, Will James. And he got a job in Manhattan as a gopher for an advertising agency, Benton Bowles, and he was earning 35 bucks a week. But hey, what that... Ad- back then, big money. One of the things that happened was because he was in New York and he was working at his advertising agency, his... Comic pa- companies are here. He crossed paths with uh, Timely Comics. And this would have been in the late 40s, 1947, 1948. He got a job working on some Marvel stuff, mostly Westerns. His, his first work is probably a two-gun kid, although some people think it might be a kid cult story, 1948. But he did titles like Wild Western Comics, and like I said, two-gun kid and kid cult. Some superhero stuff, he did a Captain America story. One guy. One Captain America story. Russ Heath is not known for his superhero stuff. Uh, he's known for his war and his Western stuff, but we'll get into that. But he had Captain America Comics number 71, a story called Fate Fix the Fight. He also did a uh, Human Torch story a little bit later on. This is back when Timely was trying to bring Torch, Submariner, and Cap back in the late 40s, Maybe early 50s baby. after they'd been canceled the first time around. Uh, they did do that briefly for a year or two. That's when Venus was out. Time for Venus to come back. Yeah, Venus did come back. She was in uh, Agents of Atlas. Yeah, she was. It hasn't been seen since. Along with a bunch of other 50 characters that uh, Marvel had made up along the way, but none of which were worked on by Russ Heath. He did uh, Arizona Kid. He did all Western Winners. He did Black Rider. He did Western Outlaws. He did Reno Brown. He just, just did a ton of Western stuff. And one of the things that Heath's style was best known for was being clean, and he drew in a very realistic way, not just anatomy, but also things like cars, tanks, planes, uniforms. I mean, he would go to, later in his career, he would go to Army surplus stores. He'd buy helmets, he'd buy uniforms, even though he was already in the military, and he knew what would go with what character mm-hmm. for his stories. But he would buy the uniforms, he'd buy rifles, he'd buy... Uh, rifles? Well, the stuff that was available at Army I surplus mean. stores. I'm sure that they were non-working. I hope so. Uh, and he would use those as his models to draw this stuff in his World War II stories, his Army stories. Uh, the same with his Western stuff. He would, he would get cowboy hats and, and other stuff. And he would use those. And his art was very authentic in that respect. It was very realistic. Paul Levitt said if Russ Heath was drawing a pirate ship that was sunk at the bottom of an ocean, you can bet that Russ Heath would be drawing every barnacle and every broken plank and every fish that would be down in that area at that time, what he was drawing in order to make it as authentic as humanly possible. He was very much known for his detail work, which of course meant he didn't do a lot of work because that takes time. Yeah. But he loved doing Western stuff. He worked at Timely for the uh, first part of his career, and then he migrated over to D.C. at some point, probably when Timely ran out of work for him. Uh, and he ran up with Robert Kaniger. Two of them co-created the Haunted Tank together, and that was in G.I. Combat. Uh, Haunted Tank, for those of you who don't know, it was uh, Jeb Stewart and three other guys. They were in a tank in uh, World War II in uh, Africa, and back when we were in the African campaign. And they would be guided, literally, by the ghost mm-hmm. of Stonewall Jackson, I think it was. Was it Stonewall Jackson? I feel I'm not like sure. But it was, yeah, Jeb Stewart. No, Jeb Stewart. Jeb Stewart, Stewart. Jeb Stewart was giant. No, that, that's what it was. It was Jeb Stewart because the tank leader, Jeb Stewart, was a descendant of the original Confederate general, Jeb yes. Stewart. And that was the connection between I'm the two. I'm being led by my ancestor. And Jeb Stewart, the ghost of him, would come to his, his descendant and Help him out. basically do Yoda wisdom. You know, do Obi-Wan with... You know, you have to fire to the left, not the right. Yeah, well, it's stuff like no, that. No, come that way. They Don't wouldn't, go it that wouldn't, way. It was one of those things, he wouldn't give them the answers. No. But, but he would say, well, I think that maybe you should follow the course of your true heart. Mm. At which point, Jeb would go, well, I'm facing north, so I guess that means we go north. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. And mm-hmm. even though they co-created the book, yeah. Keith came to hate it after a while because every story was almost exactly the same. Yeah, well, how far can you go with that entire idea? <laughs> I'm going to follow this ghost who can tell me which direction to go. Oh. But Haunted Tank was a mainstay at DC Comics in GI Combat 
right up into the 80s. I remember that was one of uh, DC's Dollar Comics, uh, G.I. Combat, featuring the Haunted Tank and Jim Stewart. And while Heath did draw some of those, I think Joe Kubert was also drawing some of those. Yeah, he drew a couple. At that point. But that was a mainstay right up until the late 70s, early 80s. That was one of DC's Dollar Comics until they finally canceled the book in, uh, in the early 80s. I remember getting G.I. Combat in at the Comic Book Emporium Mm -hmm. every month. We only got like three or four copies of it because it didn't sell. But then again, we were also getting Sergeant Rocket, which was also being published. Which he also drew back in the uh, 60s, but predominantly in the early 70s. Mm -hmm. Because I remember his Heat stuff. But we also got that at um, Comic Book Emporium, too. And we didn't get very many copies of that either because the war stuff just wasn't big sellers. You know, everybody was buying X-Men and Spider-Man. I'm not buying that book. It's boring. DC War stuff... That stuff fairly really registered, which is why, well, the genre eventually died out. Yeah. But uh, he co-created G.I. Combat. He also worked on Sea Devils over at DC. And, and these are all titles that most comic book fans today, Who? unless you're of a certain age, Who? you wouldn't know. But Sea Devil, Devils was a big title back in the 50s, just like Challenges of the Unknown was. And it, it's fallen to the wayside since then. Nobody really cares much about it. And DC sure doesn't care all that much Did about it. Did you read Sea Devil? Sea Devils was all about a bunch of guys who would... Basically, it was... Here's another reference that nobody's going to get. Uh, sea Hunt yeah. with uh, Lloyd Bridges. Yeah. It was basically that with three or four guys. And they go under under the water and, and find shrunken pirate ships. It was adventure stories. Well, you didn't have Thanos trying to recreate reality. Instead, you had a bunch of guys out there having adventures. Did they ever run across Aquaman? No, different. Then what the hell? It was all part of DC. What well, the hell none of the war stories ever ran into yeah. Superman or Batman either. Now, I mentioned before that he was probably the most famous person you've never heard of, because in the '60s, the uh, op art craze was going on in real art. Okay, not comic book art, but in real art. You know, the gallery stuff, art. Gallery art. The stuff that you go to the Art Institute to say, hey, look at that. And an artist named Roy Lichtenstein, who was very famous at the time, for doing op art. And pop art. He was second only to uh, Andy Warhol. Andy Warhol. Yeah, in, in the art scene at, at that time. He took a couple of Russ Heath's panels, mm-hmm. blew them up to huge canvas sizes, and basically made a fortune in his career off of doing that. The problem with it is Russ Heath was never credited. I got no money. I got well, nothing. It wasn't even money. He didn't even get any credit for it. Most people who saw those panels he assumed... Did. Lichtenstein did the whole thing. That Roy Lichtenstein did it. But it wasn't true. And he didn't. It was Russ Heath's panels. And the best one of them is Wham, which is the name that Roy Lichtenstein gave the painting, is Wham. It's it's a picture of a back end of what would probably be a, a P-15 fighter jet during the Korean War being hit by a, a missile and exploding in the front. He would blow this up to the point where all of the little printing stuff, like little dots and stuff that would go into making shadows, yeah. would be blown up. So you're looking at all the little dots. The little dots are the size of, of like marbles on the canvas, and you can actually see them. Whereas if you're looking at them on a the comic book page, you really have to get in close to see mm. them and, and see what they're like. But Heath never got any credit for that, ever, ever. And it wasn't until near the end of his death... He finally did a one-page comic strip bemoaning the fact that... I got robbed. He never uh, never got any credit for it. And, yeah, he never got any money. He never got any recognition. No. And, you know, you can have a debate about whether or not if you take stuff from a pre-existing medium and then transform it into something else, repurpose it in a new medium, yeah. whether or not that's an actual work of art. Comic books reverse engineer that all the time. Yeah. Comic books are always taking whatever's popular right now and shoving it in their pages. Mm-hmm. Marvel team up with Saturday Night Live. The Superboy books in the uh, 60s, they would do Bonnie and Clyde issues of Superboy when Bonnie and Clyde was hot. Superman would be flying across a beach and a giant shark would come out and grab his cape when Jaws was out. Comic books have been ripping off pop culture for years. This is an example of pop culture ripping off comic books, but he never got any credit for that. That ain't right. Well, it's not right. It's not right. He should have gotten some sort of credit. Some money would have been nice, but at the very least, he should have gotten credit. And that wham, that wasn't the only time that happened with Lichtenstein. There were other paintings that he did that he cribbed off of and made into big full-size paintings that hung hung in art galleries. Wham was at, I don't know if it still is, but it was was at the Art Institute for a long time down in the loop. Uh, You can go down there and see it and go, oh, look, it's Russ Heath. (laughs) No, it's not. It's Roy Lichtenstein. But it's not. But and, it is. And you can get into, I'm sure, debates with art critics about, well, but that wasn't important. Well, yes, it is important. Yeah, it's, it's, That's the source it's material my idea you got it from. The other thing, if you're of an age, which you would remember Russ Heath for, mm-hmm. 
would be the ads on the back of comics mm-hmm. for 100 Roman soldiers or 100 Revolutionary War soldiers. On the backs of comics, there was an ad, late 60s, early 70s, where you could buy 100 Roman soldiers for like a dollar or something, or 100 Revolutionary War soldiers. The art on just that ad was really beautiful and incredibly detailed. You would literally have 100 soldiers they're all doing something different, and they all have different facial expressions, and they all have different movements about them. But those two ads, those are about as iconic as you can get for the back cover of a comic book. And Russ Heath, he drew both of those. And he didn't get any credit for those no. because, well, it was an advertising job. Yeah, thank you. And, and, which is different from Roy Lichtenstein stealing a panel okay, and making a painting out of it. This was an advertising job, and the people who made the 100 Roman soldiers or the 100 Revolutionary War soldiers, they didn't want to have the artist's name on it. He did it. And and so he didn't get any credit for that either, but that's also someplace where you might have run across Russ Heath's work. 132 Roman soldiers, only $2.25. Kids, cut this coupon out of the back of your comic and send it in today. I have seen more than one comic from that era with that coupon cut out. Why'd you do that? Because he told me to do that. I could do a thing. He got 50 bucks for doing each one of those pages. That's 100 bucks altogether for all those pages. <laughs> like I said, I came into contact with Russ Heath from his army at war work. Mm-hmm. I was a big fan of Sergeant Rock back in the uh, very early 70s. Our army at war with Sergeant Rock. Around two... 35 to 30 through about 300. I would read that every month, bi-monthly. Bi-monthly, I take that back. It was a bi-monthly book. I didn't buy any of those books. And I those real, books were boring I, to me. I, well, you know, they were all little morality tests. Yeah. It was not gung-ho, no, no, no. kill the crowd type no. stuff. It was, you know, we're here to do a job, and we don't like doing the job, but we're stuck doing the job, job, and that's a job we got to do. And then there would always be this moral thing that would come up. Mm-hmm. You know, how... how What is this moral thing that we have to get past or get around or come to terms with in order to get the job done? Ain't nothing easy about Easy Company. But that's where I first ran into Russ Heath. And I really, really liked his art a lot in those books. I mean, I I always wish that he had done other stuff. Like, I would have loved to have seen him on Superman or Batman or Justice Justice League. Nope, don't do that. No, that never happened. Take the one. The next big phase of his career, once you got into the 70s, was he assisted on Harvey Kurtzman and Will Elder's Little Annie Fanny strip. Playboy. For uh, Playboy. There was a story about him at the Playboy Mansion, which uh, you're familiar with, Bo. <laughs> yeah, Harvey Kurtzman was working on a deadline, so he told Heath to uh, come to the Playboy Mansion to work and help him get the strips out because they popped up every month. The Playboy Mansion was where Russ Heath apparently lived for about three or four months before they realized he was still there and threw him out. <laughs> But it was a free apartment, 24-hour food, uh, playmates running all over the place. So, you know, hot and cold running playmates. Hot and cold running playmates. You know, so he was there. Why working. would you want to leave? Yeah, he said, <laughs> why would I leave? I mean, I, I did pay my rent. And so he was there for about three or four months before someone in his playboy machine goes, why is he still here? Get out! <laughs> so they threw him out. And they threw him out. He had a drawing table, too. He brought the drawing table with him. So how do you not at notice the play, a, at the yeah, how do you not notice a guy with a drawing table in a room working? It's like, why is he in here again? <sighs> Mitch was pretty big, but it must have been big. You didn't notice the guy was there. Was it Heff that threw him out? Or uh, no, no, no. Heff would never. Get that guy it. out of here. Heff would never do something like that. Heff would, <laughs> if it was up to Heff, he'd still be, he would have lived there forever but until he moved. But no, it's probably someone who worked at the mansion because Heff wasn't there all the time and went, why are you still in here? What are you drawing? We don't even run this strip anymore. Get out. Uh, but he worked on that strip for a while. And at some point, by the time you get to the late 70s, he was off of Little Annie Fanny. His work at DC had pretty much dried up because all the all the war comics were coming up to being canceled. Yeah. Uh, yeah nobody's buying DC them. canceled just about all the war comics by the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, his Western stuff, he'd done the bulk of that over at Marvel because Marvel was doing Westerns in the 60s and late 50s. But DC had Western comics, but it was like Jonah Hex. Scalp Hunter in Weird Western. And it was that just was, stuff he didn't work on. Well, I think it was stuff that people like, were already assigned to. Yeah. So. They already had teams on it. So he might have done a fill-in or two. He did. That was it. He did. Just, yeah, he did. I forgot about this. He did do an issue of the Immortal Iron Fist. Okay. Uh, well, I think uh, it was an Orson Randall story. Well, he jumped around and he did some stuff. He yeah. did a uh, couple issues of Mr. Miracle yeah. uh, when uh, back when um, Mike Golden was doing the book. Yeah. And the one that you were just talking about, Iron Fist. But he eventually left and migrated to California where he got a job in animation where he would do storyboard work in animation there and that's not as unheard of as you might think Mike Plug moved out there mm-hmm. 
Jack Kirby. Right now. Jack Kirby moved out there. They would network with each other. Yeah. And they'd get them out there. Finally, he retired from comics. He got an Ink Pot Award in 1997. He was inducted into the Eisner Comic Book Hall of Fame in 2009. Received a couple of other awards. He passed away from cancer on August the 23rd mm-hmm. of this year. And he survived by his daughter, Sharon. And uh, I think that's it. I'm not sure if he had any other relatives. I know he divorced his wife yeah. back in the 60s, which probably made hanging out at the Playboy Mansion yeah, much easier. Yeah, hang out here. Uh, if you are looking for some of Russ Heat's work, uh, check out his All-American Men of War, GI Combat, of course, which we mentioned. He did Our Army at War, which I mentioned that I was reading. He did a lot of film stuff like Legends of the Dark Knight, 46, 47, 48, 49. That's obviously a story arc. There's also Sea Devils, which we talked about. He did almost all of those. Some Sergeant Rock stuff, Sergeant Rock specials, uh, odd issues of Showcase Comics, and Shadow, Hitler's Astrologer, for uh, Marvel back in uh, 1988, hmm. which I think would have been working with Kaluta. Yeah, they uh, prob- well, they probably knew each other. So. Yeah, that's where I I was sorry to hear that he died, even though I hadn't thought much about him for a long time, because he just hadn't been around. Yeah, no, he, was, he worked, but he didn't work a lot. But I always had a soft spot for his work. I'm sorry to see him go. I hope uh, his daughter is doing well. That's it for Russ Heath. We're going to take a break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about Maurice Severin. Hey, folks, Comic Book Man here. Most people don't know this, but I got my start in comics retail on February 20th, 1978, when I became the store manager of the Comic Book Emporium. Sixteen years later, I opened Alternate Reality on August 20th, 1994. Like Superman's penchant for double L's, it seems the 20th has always been an important part of my life. I respect that heritage, which is why we have a Founder's Day sale on the 20th of each month here at the store. Every 20th, stop by and you'll save 20% off all of your purchases, all day long, only at Alternate Reality. Okay, and we're back. Marie Severin, she passed away at the end of September, Wednesday, August 29th to be exact. She is a trailblazer in an era when women were not very well represented in the comic book industry. She was. She, along with a handful of other women like uh, Ramona Fredon. Well, to a lesser extent, Ramona Fredon. Well, Ramona Fredon did a lot of work in comics, yeah. but she didn't get nearly as much publicity. No. But she, she was working steadily in the industry up until a couple of years ago. And, of course, over at Marvel, Flo Steinberg, mm-hmm. who was the queen of the office, yes. who kept, kept, the train running. kept the train running. But there weren't a lot of female artists, writers, creators in comics during the era that she worked. And so she's a real trailblazer in that respect. If you're a woman and you're looking for somebody whose career you can look at and, and go, I want to be like her, she's not a bad one to she pick. Did. She did a lot of work at Marvel and she wore a lot of hats production person primarily but she was an artist she was an inker yeah and a colorist actually her first job was as a colorist but we'll get to that in a minute she was born august 21st 1929 east rockaway new york and she was born into a family of creative individuals they're all Um, creative actually all of them her father john immigrated from norway and he was an artist who studied at the pratt institute in brooklyn he designed packaging for elizabeth arden cosmetics which is a company that I don't believe exists anymore, but I, rem- no. I remember the name growing up. Yeah. Elizabeth Arden was, was a big deal force in the cosmetic industry. Mm-hmm. He designed packaging for them. Her mother was a homemaker. She stayed at home, but she designed and sewed her own clothes. And I assume she did the same thing for her kids, too. Probably. Made so, yeah. She was very creative as well, even though she never went out and made a name for herself. She raised the kids and created her own clothes. She's probably best known for being the sister to John Severin, her brother, Mm -hmm. who was a comic book artist. Uh, 2012, John Severin died. John Severin, his art style was a lot like uh, what we just talked about with Russ Heath. Heath, Yeah, Yeah, he also did a lot of war stuff, although he did do a lot more mainstream comics Mm -hmm. than Russ Heath did. But uh, his... um, he was probably best known for doing uh, war stuff, especially at EC during the 50s. Yeah. But that, but that's his career. But the two of them, they were a couple of years apart, but they'd come home from school and they'd sit at the kitchen table and they'd copy comics. They'd draw. They'd both draw. They would sit at the kitchen table before dinner, after they did their homework, and they'd practice drawing. And then later, after dinner, into the night. And that's how they honed their craft, which isn't a terrible way to learn how to draw. You need anatomy classes and well, stuff yeah, at some point, too. But, I mean, if that's what you want to do, that's that, comics have always been a great beginning mm-hmm. training ground for doing that. You don't want to learn anatomy from comics. But no. if, if you have any interest at all in drawing, comics are a Got great sure. entry-level drug for that. She graduated from uh, All Girls Roman Catholic School in Brooklyn. 
she followed her father's footsteps very briefly at the mm-hmm. Pratt Institute, which I don't think she was really all that sold on. No, it Be- didn't last that long. Because she got a job in 1949 as a colorist for EC Comics. And one of the things she would do at EC was if she thought that a panel... This went too was, far. Or a scene was either too gory or yeah. too violent or too, quote-unquote, sexy. Yeah. She just darkened the colors up a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so it wasn't quite as obvious. <laughs> <laughs> I'll hide this by doing this. Yeah, so she was editorializing the stories mm-hmm. without actually doing any editorial. No, she was just basically, I can cuddle this this way and it doesn't look as bad. Uh, anyway, she stayed with the EC until it folded in 1954 after the Senate had their big hearings on comics and juvenile delinquency. These which, comics are ruining my child's morality! Which basically shut down EC Comics after yeah. that. They survived a year or so after that doing... Uh, comics like MD yeah. and the humor comic Panic mm-hmm. but uh, eventually William Gaines just shut the company so down and said story. you know what I'll form Mad Magazine instead yeah you oh. know what I'm going to do Mad Magazine and William Gaines is famous for saying I will never go back to doing mainstream comics ever again mm-hmm. in my life he made Mad Magazine and that's he all he did, did was humor and did. satire from that you point on Marie didn't join him. No. She got freelance work at Timely Atlas, mm-hmm. and she also got a job drawing educational illustrations for the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, of all things. What are you going to learn? All of which kept her actually in New York mm-hmm. at the time, right up until the early 1960s when Stan Lee came in. Hi! And Marie, said, come on over here to work. And come on, well, Stan and Jack came Take up. Take it over. Stan and Jack came up with Fantastic Four, came up with Thor, came Take up it with, over. Uh, with most of the stuff that has made Disney a ton of money today. Yes, lots of money. Along with Steve Ditko's help. Yeah. But when Marvel caught fire, Stan knew mm-hmm. her from her work at Atlas. I know you. Her coloring work. You can work here. And he hired her, not as a colorist. No. Not as an inker. No. But as a production assistant. Yeah. <laughs> Which lasted as long as it took for her to get a ad drawing in Esquire magazine. She did a drawing for Esquire back right around this time. It was a freelance illustration she did. I think it was for an ad. And as soon as that hit mm-hmm. and it got around the Marvel office that she this draw. girl that this girl who's in production just got an ad in Esquire. Hey, you are you did draw a book. Well and that when they she started getting drawing assignments. Yeah. She started doing some drawing work for Marvel. She worked on Daredevil. Mm -hmm. She worked on Iron Man. She worked on Captain America, which would have been Tales of Suspense. Mm -hmm. And if she didn't draw or ink that stuff, she was also, she also did touch-up work. Yeah. Hi, this this page just came in, and we need you to to touch up a couple of panels. Can you do that? And she would do do that a lot. She was doing the John Romita thing. That's what John Romita Sr. was doing for a while. You go, well, this is not really done. Could we touch this up? And you go, give it to John. He can do it. And Marie, give it to Marie. She can do it. She was also well known for her work on Tales to Astonish on both Submariner and Hulk Mm -hmm. at this time. And then once they all graduated to their own book, she also continued doing work on Hulk Mm -hmm. as both an artist and an inker. Mm -hmm. But she also got to work with her brother John, who was at Marvel at the time doing Call the Conqueror. That's back when Marvel got a hold of the Robert E. Howard characters. All the Howard stuff. And Marvel decided, okay, well, we not only have Conan, we, we Cole. also have Cull, we also have King Red Conan, Red Sonia, Red Sonia, we got all these folks. And so everybody wound up getting their own book. And John Severin, and I've never been a big one for Barbarian stuff, mm-hmm. and I've never owned any of the Cull stuff, but mm-hmm. running a comic book store for 40 years, I've come across that stuff and looked at it. That is some gorgeous artwork in that book. For my money, the John Severin stuff in those Culls are on par with the Barry Windsor Smith stuff in Conan. Yeah, but Barry Windsor Smith was flashier. It was flashier, yeah. He was flashier. He was definitely but, like, what the heck is this? But John Severin's stuff on Cull was great. And like I said, Marie Severin inked his stuff. Now, during this period, I mentioned before with Russ Heath, I picked up his Our Army at War stuff back in the 70s. Previous to that, in the late 60s, Marie Severin had a big influence on me. Mm-hmm. Back in 66, 67, 68, Marvel did a humor book called Not Brand Eck, mm-hmm. which I loved. Mm-hmm. I loved Not Brand Eck. I got every issue of Not Brand Eck when it came out. You're the one. And huh? she was the spiritual force behind Not Brand Eck. Because one of the things they found out in the offices was... Not only could she illustrate any superhero book that was out there, humor. she was a great humorist. I mean, she do great caricatures of not only people, but also comic book characters. Mm-hmm. And she had books full of illustrations of goofy Captain America, goofy Hulk, goofy Thor, just sketches, drawings of these characters. Mm-hmm. And they looked at that, and 
that was the big impetus behind them doing Not Brand Eck. Mm-hmm. Now, Not Brand Eck never sold all that well. No. Mar- Marvel has had two runs at doing a humor book. Well, three, four. Let me take that back, four. Not Brand Eck. They did reprints of Not Back yeah. Brand Eck in the early 70s in a comic called Spoof, which yeah. lasted all five issues. Then they did their magazine, which was their version of Mad Magazine, yeah. which was... God, what was the name of that? Irving Forbush was the uh, mascot for it. Crazy. Crazy. Okay. Crazy. Crazy ran for like 70, 80 issues. It ran for a while. And then they did a thing called What The. Yeah, What The. In the uh, in late, late 80s. 80s, late 80s, early 90s. During the comic book explosion mm-hmm. in the uh, late 80s, early what 90s. What The. They rolled a humor book out. They rolled it out. It lasted seven or eight issues. I'm not sure if Marie had any input on that, but Marvel's had four runs at humor books. Mm-hmm. The magazine took off, but that was a magazine that was going to newsstand distribution, yeah. and that they made that look as much like Madden Cracked as they possibly could, in order to. If, I well, wonder why. Well, if nothing else, if you're looking for Mad, you might pick that up by this mistake. This is sold out. Oh, you got this? Okay. Well, you pick it up by mistake. Yeah. But all of that started with Not Brand Eck, and Not Brand Eck started because of Maurice Severin's humor drawings. Mm-hmm. Now, what's interesting about Not Brand Echo is it was Marvel making fun of itself at a yes, time when it heavily, had just started. Heavily making fun of itself. Now, they also made fun of Superman. That was a Superman parody they did. They also made fun of Archie. There was an Archie parody yeah. they did. They, th- their targets weren't just Marvel, but what was interesting about it is they parodied themselves, and they parodied themselves in a way that was pretty pointed in some cases. Jack Kirby, believe it or not, drew a couple of strips for them, Mm -hmm. Fantastic Four stuff. He drew it in the same humorous style that Maurice Severn had. Mm -hmm. And the funny thing about that brand deck is they have never reprinted that in any meaningful way over at Marvel. They've never done an archive edition or a Masterworks edition of all that stuff, and they could easily do it. Well, send them a letter. Well, I've never done uh, a Masterworks edition. I, I would pick that up. Yeah. I, I don't I don't own a lot in the way of archives or Masterworks anymore. I used to own all of them. But I would pick that up just to read the damn things because I haven't seen them in years. I've got some of them still in my collection, but mm-hmm. I have to dig them back out. And they've never done any soft covers with any of that stuff, yeah. which I always thought was odd because Marvel has gone out of its way to reprint just about every damn thing they've ever it's done. It's coming. Or send them a letter. Send them a letter. Hey, letter, letter. hey why don't you reprint this not burning? Uh, uh, but when you do this stuff, Captain America was Charlie America. And Charlie. The, book, the Mighty Thor was the Mighty Soar, yeah. as in I'm Mighty Soar, get yeah. it? You would have the Incredible Hulk was the in, Inedible Bulk. Yeah. And Iron Man would be Iron... Iron Sam? Iron Sam or something. Somewhere. Yeah, something like that. And it'd be stuff like Iron Man would uh, have a screw sticking out where his nose would be in his helmet, or Captain America would have a small lowercase a on his forehead and his shield would be a garbage can lid with the stars and stripes on it. Or the Incredible Bulk was just a big baby yeah. blown up to the size of the Hulk jumping around screaming about everything. And Mighty Sword, you'd have a chicken on his head. His helmet had wings. It's funny stuff, man. But, well, it actually, you know, when I was seven, eight years old, when I was, was reading this stuff, yeah, it was funny stuff because I knew all of this stuff from reading Marvel Comics. Mm-hmm. And then they were commenting on the stuff that I was reading. And at the same time, I'm reading about Parallel Earths over in DC Comics, where you have Earth 1, Earth 2, mm-hmm. the JSA, the JLA. And I'm looking at this stuff and going, you know, is this stuff a Parallel Earth? Is this like another Earth that's out there? Which, with all the crap that Marvel's done and all the parallel Earths and the 89,000 Earths that were out there once upon a time, mm-hmm. there's no reason why this can't be an existing Earth with all this stuff on it. I don't think so. Anyway, that was not Brand Eck. And then the other thing that she's probably best known for would be a little later on in the late 70s. She is the person who put together the the designs mm-hmm. and set up the character background for Jessica Drew, the very first Spider-Woman. Yes. And that's what wound up being the animated series mm-hmm. uh, that was on ABC. Mm-hmm. And so she's responsible for the red and yellow costume that is most associated she, she with did. Jessica Drew. She came up with it. That's her. She designed that thing. Obviously, she had a very wry sense of humor. She was not known as being very serious around the office. She was serious about her work. Yeah. But she was always jovial and in a good mood. She always tried to get along with everybody. Mm -hmm. And she always had a good time Mm -hmm. while she was at work. I'm sure every day wasn't a joy. But you could always count on Maurice Severin having a a damn good attitude about stuff. She's cheerful. And she was the humorous vein that ran through Marvel Comics for a long time. Back when Mar- at a time when Marvel could make fun of itself, which apparently they're incapable of doing anymore because, hey. you know what? We are just too damn serious about hey, everything not, all the time. Not, 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 not came back for a one shot. 
Forbish Man came back. Yeah, they did the 14th issue of yes. Not Brand X. Yes. a one shot about two years ago, yes. which nobody bought. And, you know, it, the humor comics have never sold well in comics. You know, funny stuff just doesn't sell. We talked before about Ambush Bug. Ambush Bug would sell a ton of books if they just turn him into a funny assassin with a gun. You mean Deadpool? Deadpool. <laughs> that is the only humorous character who sells. Probably Deadpool. Quinn. To a lesser extent, although her origins are probably purer than yeah. Deadpool's origins are, but to a lesser extent, and part of the problem with Harley Quinn is, well, you have the same problem with Deadpool. She's not quite right in the head, yes. which is in- integral to her origin. Yeah. She, I mean, no, she, 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 Harley Quinzel is nuts, and Deadpool, I guess, is too. His strip is more like Bugs Bunny. Well, you know, if Bugs Bunny was a assassin who was killing people. <laughs> Works for me. <laughs> and Harley Quinn doesn't come off as being Bugs Bunny. No. I've always got the impression that they know what they want to do with Harley Quinn, but they don't know how to get there. Yeah. That's always been the impression with Harley mm-hmm. Quinn. They, they know where they're heading. They just don't know how to get there from here. Mm-hmm. And they try a lot of different avenues. They try to cut down the TNA part of it. And that was an avenue that they tried for a while yeah. until they realized, you know what? Making her little Annie Fanny yeah. no, it's not really is right. not the road to success no. with this no. character. No. Probably a good idea. But anyway, back to Marie Severin. She more or less retired from the industry by the time you get to the late 80s, although she had a strong connection with Marvel throughout her entire career up until the end, although I'm sure she wasn't doing much of anything at Marvel. No. We're probably getting a check, though. She was quoted as once saying that people say that women gossip. Well, what men do is called networking. Mm -hmm. Female gossiping is male networking. Yeah, it's networking. And it's basically all gossiping ever is or ever was, was women networking one another. Uh, In 2001, she was named to the Will Eisner Comics Hall of Fame. She passed away on August 29th, 2018. And she was survived by no one. She had no immediate survivors. I guess she wasn't married. No, she was living in a uh, nursing home when she died. Yeah, she was living in a nursing home. So... That's it from Marie Severin. If you ever get a chance, if you ever do come across any of the Not Brand X stuff, or if you ever come across any of her stuff, the late 60s, early 70s comics, take a look at it. It's worth looking at. If you're looking for some ideas, actually, she did a lot of humor stuff at Marvel in the 80s. She worked on a lot of issues of Elf. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know, Elf. She worked on Captain America, 115, 124, 25, 27, 28, 30, 31, uh, Daredevil, 61, 2, 3, 4... Uh, that era, Conan the Barbarian, a couple of handful of issues here and there. When Marvel did the Coneheads back as a comic mm-hmm. back in the 80s, she worked on that. Her issues of the Hulk were from between 102 and 110, and then scattered throughout I after that. I think she inked the Harlow Ellison uh, Hulk stuff. That was that might have been her. John Severn drew it, though. Yeah. I'm pretty sure John Severn drew it. She did a lot towards... And John Severn, too, because I think he inked it, too. They both did some really beautiful work on Herb Trumpy. Mm-hmm. Herb Trumpy was the artist on Hulk back in that period. And I always thought that they were the only inkers that made his stuff pleasing to the eye. Herb Trumpy was a guy. She worked on Iron Man 18 through, like, say, 30 on and off. Called her Conqueror, I mentioned before. Mighty Mouse, when Marvel had Mighty Mouse. Uh, when Marvel did Muppet Baby, she worked on Muppet Babies. Like I said, a lot of that, uh, well, that star stuff, which would which would be in keeping with her sense of humor mm-hmm. and her, her attitude towards things. And that's it for Marie Severin. I'll rest in peace. We're going to take a break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about Gary Friedrich, who passed away also. Every Sunday is super at Alternate Reality with our Super Sunday Sale. Each Sunday, we pick a different character, family, or publisher, and we discount all of their comics and trade paperbacks 25% off all day long. What we pick for the sale is different each week, but each Sunday you'll save 25% off. And that's all day long, all day Sunday, only at Alternate Reality. And we're back. Uh, We're going to wrap up the show with talking about Gary Friedrich. Gary, and not to be confused with Mike Friedrich, who was also a writer during the same period that Gary is known for. Should have formed a band. The Friedrichs. (laughs) They probably could have been. Could have been a band. Friedrich is best known for being the co-creator of both Ghost Rider and Son of Satan. Damien Hellstrom. To a, to a lesser degree, Son of State, obviously. Yeah. He hasn't had any movies made out of him yet. No. But uh, Ghost Rider, he's the guy. He passed away on Tuesday, the 28th of August, at the age of 75. 
Friedrich was born in Jackson, Missouri in 1943. One of his first writing assignments was at the school newspaper, Mm -hmm. at the high school newspaper. And at that time, that's where he ran into future editor-in-chief at Marvel and his friend, Roy Thomas. Roy Thomas. The they had a band. They had a band. A yeah. Well, the two of them grew up in the same town. Yeah. And they went to the small same town. high school. Small town. I worked in the same uh, high school newspaper. And they both got jobs working at the uh, local movie theater, the Jackson Movie Palace. They were both ushers there. And they also played in rock and roll brands together. The Events Pretzel and the Transjordanaires. Yeah, well, creative That names. would have been the 50s. Yeah, it had to have been the 50s. That would have been the 50s. After graduation, he worked as a managing editor at the bi-weekly Jackson Pioneer newspaper in the same town. The uh, Roy Thomas that we talked about, mm-hmm. he left. He moved on. He moved to New York. He moved on. And he moved to New York and he eventually got a job at Marvel, which yeah. is important for Gary Friedrich because that's who got him in at Marvel. In the, in the 60s, Fridge was still working at that uh, newspaper. newspaper, and he got a hold of Roy Thomas, and Thomas said, you know, why don't you come up to uh, New York? You'd be a good comic book writer. Yeah, I can get you some work. There's a lot of stuff going on up here right now that you'd probably be interested in doing. So he moved to the Big Apple, and he began doing some freelance writing. Mm-hmm. Nothing steady. He wasn't hired no. on anywhere. No. But he it was work, though. But he would wind up coming into the orbit of other comic book creators. Yeah. Like, he lived for a while with Submariner creator Bill Everett. In a New York apartment mm-hmm. because he didn't have any money. And Rents are expensive. Assume Everett needed somebody to help pay the bills. Right, and keep so an he, eye on him. Uh, he also got a job briefly with Topps Trading Cards. Mm-hmm. While he was at Topps, he worked on the Mars Attacks series, which became the big deal thing, Huge thing. that uh, they were known for. And he also ran into future mm-hmm. famous indie artist Art Spiegelman. When uh, they were doing the uh, Superman cards, Topps did a set of Superman cards in the mid-60s. I would assume that was probably, I know they did Adventures of Superman cards. I don't think that was them. I think they also did a run of comic cards because that would have been about the time of the Superman animated series. Mm -hmm. His most prolific period began in 1966 when Thomas got him on board at Marvel because Thomas had gotten to the point where he had picked up almost all of Dan Lee's work. Yeah, and it, it was it cru- wasn't almost. It was all a Stanley. And work. it was crushing him. Yeah, I can't <laughs> do all these books, Stan. I need time to breathe, man. And so Friedrich started working on a number of assignments, including yes. Sergeant Fury and his Howling Commandos. Yes. Now, this was a run on the book that I had forgotten, but when I was doing some research for his obituary, mm-hmm. I came across some. Sergeant Fury was originally Stan and Jack. Yeah, and then it was Roy Thomas who wrote it for a while. And then Gary Friedrich wrote it, and then after Friedrich was done with it, it went into a reprint book. Mm-hmm. It was a reprint book from that point on. But Friedrich wrote a bunch of uh, Sergeant Fury issues back in the day, starting with issue 42. Mm-hmm. And almost consistently from 42 to about 100, he wrote all those issues. And I don't think that most of them were probably very good. <laughs> not to be not to be terrible about it. But I com- never... I. Always avoided those. Well, like practice. I said, with Russ, with Russ Heath, I read the Our Army at War stuff, yeah. and I always thought that the Sergeant Fury stuff was kind of silly. <laughs> and so, silly? Well, the Our Army at War stuff was much more realistic. The Sergeant Fury stuff was more, you know, every cover of Sergeant Fury had Fury with a cigar ah. clenched in his teeth firing his machine gun at yeah, somebody so and after a while that it's like well okay I see the direction this is like, going we'll give as opposed gun. to the Sergeant Rock stuff which looked like it dealt a lot more with just the average GI trying to get through a day in the war of Frank Rock you know they would have a lot of action covers but I mean there were also a lot of covers where Frank Rock's got his head hung low and he's walking away from a battle and saying come on easy it's time to saddle up and move on to the next battle you know, and you can tell that they're all dead tired it seemed more realistic at the well, time but Friedrich wrote that like forever yes. in a day over at Marvel. While he was working on the Western characters, he came across them uh, while he was working on the war stuff. He had had an idea in the back of his head about mixing Marlon Brando's The Wild Ones, which was a popular, popular guy. movie back in the 50s. Yes. Mixing that with a Western character, mm-hmm. but updating it yeah. for today. Yeah, you got a lone rider mm-hmm. going cross country on a motorcycle instead of a horse. Him. But writing wrongs. So flaming it. That would be where Mike Plug came in. Mm-hmm. Now Mike Plug was working at Marvel at the same time. Yeah. He had done a uh, adaptation of uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and mm-hmm. the Frankenstein comic. He also the worked, horror line was just starting at that point. The horror line was just starting, and he had also worked on Werewolf by Night. Yeah. It was uh, originally showed up in Marvel Spotlight, and then it graduated to its own series. Where Moon Knight came from. And that's where Moon Knight came from. Moon Knight was issue thirty-two, but the first couple of issues 
were all drawn by Mike Plug. Mm-hmm. And yeah, back in the 70s, when the restraints were taken off of Marvel for distribution and they were able to up their monthly output from 13 titles to whatever they wanted, well, yeah. that's when the Marvel explosion happened. And one of the first things Marvel looked to, well, if we can do Horror. new books, what can we do? Hey, all this horror stuff is out there, and it's all public domain. Dracula's public domain, Frankenstein's yes. public domain, the Wolfman, even yes. though there's no like story on the Wolfman. No. The idea of the Wolfman is public domain. It's a wolf, it's a werewolf. The Mummy is public domain. Yeah. So why don't we start doing all these horror comics? Because at that time also, mm-hmm. back in the late 60s, you had had this huge revival of horror stuff. Mm-hmm. Sven Gulli, his roots come from... The original Sven Gulli in the 60s, yeah. and horror hosts were all over the place. Ooh. And they're all running the same stuff. They're all running the Universal Monster stuff, because all this stuff was released to television. Count Floyd was my favorite. Well, Count Floyd. Uh, so all this monster stuff was out there, and there's this huge monster resurgence. Monsters, Adam's Family, mm-hmm. Famous Monsters famous magazine. Monsters. All this stuff was out there. Marvel actually got on that bandwagon a little Early. late. Oh, no. no, no, late. This stuff had been going on in the late 60s. Yeah. Marvel didn't get around to their horror line until 1970. Yeah. But that's because they were restrained from the number of titles they, they could put out books. by their distributor, which was, in fact, DC Comics mm-hmm. at the time, back in the 60s. Uh, the same company that owned DC Comics also owned the distribution company for comic books and that's what marvel had to go through in order to get distributed and somehow they were limited to like 13 titles can't they, can't imagine why there's only so much <laughs> there's only so much room in iraq damn it. well that's why you had a tales of suspense or tales to astonish yeah. it's not that marvel didn't want to do a captain america book. they wanted they to. couldn't fit one they on the schedule yeah, could, so could they did the ne- iraq. same with iron man so they're the next best thing they squeezed the two of them together into a book and they called it tales of suspense mm-hmm. and here's your fix for a cap and iron man for this month half story half story yeah two eight page stories or 12 page stories or whatever it was but when all this happened marvel was looking to do a horror line and gary friedrich had this idea and he oh, ran man. into at the marvel offices mike plug and together they came up with the idea of making it a supernatural character which mm-hmm. is in keeping with the original ghost rider mm-hmm. because the original ghost rider was a supernatural western yes he was the ghost rider of the plains he wore an all white outfit all with white, a white cape and a white, white mask horse and that fully covered his face and yeah, and a white okay. horse. And he rode across the plains writing wrongs. It lasted all of like five issues. All problems. But they repackaged that as Johnny Blaze, and they with Plug they put the whole Satan aspect of yes. it in there, with Johnny Blaze selling his soul to Satan. Sell my soul in order to save his dad's life yes. from cancer, which of course Satan does, and then of course being Satan. <laughs> Uh-huh. You, your dad's not going to die of cancer. He got run over by a truck instead. Yeah, he died. <laughs> <laughs> or he died in a motorcycle stunt. Barton Blade. Yeah, Barton Blade. He's died in a motorcycle stunt instead. Yeah, your dad didn't die of cancer, but gee, he died. You already made the deal, Wills. <laughs> and you already made the deal, yeah, so you're, you're screwed. Stuck. Within the pages of Ghost Rider, mm-hmm. that's where he introduced Damon Hellstrom, yeah, Son of Satan. Satan. Yeah. So they co-created Son of Satan, too, mm-hmm. which Marvel has done almost nothing with. Well. Since then, partly because his name is Son of Satan. Yeah, it's kind of hard to sell that. <laughs> Damien Hellstrom is actually easier to sell. Hellstrom's easier. Hellblazer. Look at the Hellblazer, John Constantine. Yeah, Hellblazer is easier. Yeah, if you had tried selling it as Damien Hellstrom, you might well, get I, better, I get more of the problem traction out of it. You were going to pair up tights and you have no shirt on and a big pentagram on your chest. Well, it was, cape. And so you look kind of stupid. And that's the odd thing because yeah. Ghost Rider works. Yeah. He's wearing all leather yeah. and he's got a flaming he's head. He's got a flaming head. That works. Damien Hellstrom's costume does not work at all. Well, here's the thing. It's, okay. a super, it's a superhero okay. imposed on a satanic character. Johnny Blaze turns into the Ghost Rider, okay, which means he's all bones. Well, then how come the motorcycle outfit doesn't shrink? Supernatural. Yeah. So I think it's more like he's invisible and you just see the bones. Oh, okay. Like okay. The, okay. Mus- the musculature is all there, yeah. but all you see is the bones. Yeah. And all you ever see him from is from the, the bottom of the zipper jacket up. Yeah. Anyway, because that's all you need to see. Well, the zipper was always up. It never came down. Well, every great once in a while, he'd take the gloves off. Oh, my gosh, that's skulls. But that was like every great once There's in a while. There's still bones, then. Friedrichs left Marvel in the mid-'70s. I remember one of Friedrichs' last Ghostwriter stories is he started to do this story where he was rolling Jesus Christ into the thing. It was basically a hippie. Yeah. Okay, and they weren't saying it was Jesus. But you look pretty close to him. But you didn't have to go very far right. to see what he was going with it. And I think he left because of that. So when Marvel went, you, you can't, no. Yeah, Marvel. You can't do I that. I think Marvel said, you've gone. Yeah, you, you went a little too far here on this one. Yeah, you've gone a little too far with that. As I seem to remember, Friedrich wanted to stick to his guns. Yeah, and they went, So they decided, well, you, well, you probably you, need to leave. You need to go somewhere else then. 
Um, so he left Marvel and he went to work for uh, Skywald. Yeah. That was a company that did black and white horror magazines in the mid 70s. And then he did some work at Atlas Seaboard Comics, that Stanley's brother, Larry Lieber, started in the mid to late 70s. I remember Atlas very well. I used to pick all the Atlas stuff up when it came out. Why? Because it was superhero stuff and oh. there was nothing else out there but DC and Marvel. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but they sucked. <laughs> And, and yes, they did. They blew. Yes, they did. They I remember were badly the, derivative, and they really looked like crap. The only titles that were worth a damn were Planet of the Vampires, which is just a reworking of Planet of the Apes, except with vampires. Okay. It's Planet and of the and vampires. there was a superhero thing. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Planet of the Vampires. Phoenix. 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 Okay. That was the other one. Planet of the Vampires. Okay. They're in space. They're in space. They come it's down. It's always dark. So then when do they sleep? No, 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 no. The, the, it's a space shuttle. Okay. The astronauts. Yes. They land back on Earth. Yes. And in the time that they're gone, yes. the whole planet had been turned into vampires. They weren't. Okay. Because they were off in space. And, Something and, had happened on Earth and, where everybody got turned into vampires. And I can't imagine why this wouldn't have worked. <laughs> <laughs> well... I never said it was a good concept. I just said it was one of their better concepts, which is a very low bar. Stuff is thrown out. Phoenix. Phoenix was the other one. And Wolf the Barbarian. Yeah. And Iron Jaw. Iron Jaw. Who literally had an Iron Jaw. I'm sorry. Anyway, Gary Friedrichs uh, worked for them for a while. And then... Until they went out of business because people went, this is really stupid. Well, concept. they never got more than four issues out of any one book. And uh, people didn't notice the four that were out. And they had they had distribution problems, too. Because people went, I'm not running this. This is uh, crap. <laughs> they couldn't get the books out the door. Man. That was a distribution problem. Was that, was that intentional? <laughs> was someone outside going, no, these books are not coming out? No. Anyway, he left comics altogether in 78. He returned briefly in uh, the early 90s. When Topps did decide that they were going to do a run of uh, comic books, yes. he wrote Blind. Bombast, teaming up with uh, Dick Ayers and John Severin, okay. who we mentioned previously, for a short run on that book. Um he basically fell off the face of the earth as far as comic books yeah, are concerned until 2011 when after the two Ghost Rider films came out Ghost. with Nick Cage, Friedrich decided he was going to sue mm-hmm. Marvel, Sony, Columbia, TriStar, and Hasbro, who mm-hmm. did the action figures, yeah. because he claimed that he owned the rights to the character, How that which happen? according to him, in his contract with Marvel, it was supposed to default back to him in 2001. How exactly was it going to work? Well, he sued them anyway. Yeah. And as you know, in this country, you can sue anybody for anything. Whether you win is another matter. And his old friend Roy Thomas in the trial going, I have no idea what the hell he was talking about. Well, part, one of the flies in the ointment was his old pal Roy Thomas. Yeah. In the original Ghost Rider comic in Marvel Spotlight 5, yeah. Roy Thomas's name is on the credits list yeah. as an assist by yeah. Roy Thomas, as in Roy Thomas assisted in the creation of he his character. the book. Friedrichs is the writer. Yeah. Plug was the artist. Right. And Roy Thomas got a credit as an assist, yeah. which was vague as hell, yeah. but it was there. Yeah. So his name was in there, yeah. in the mix, and that sort of screwed up the lawsuit. Yeah, it's like, how are you going to sue saying, oh, I'm, I'm on the credits? And and, and Mike Plug got left out of this altogether. It's like, what, Plug had nothing to do with it? Plug came up with the entire look of the character. Well, I, I So think, how do you say that you own the character, but Plug had nothing to do with it? I think Plug's attitude might have been, I don't want anything to do with this. Well, Plug's attitude is, I'm retired, I don't yeah. need this, I'm working in advertising, and by the way, this is a stupid lawsuit, so I'm going to not be involved in it. Uh, he wound up losing the lawsuit in Heavily, 2013, yeah. but Marvel and Gary Friedrich yeah. came to a settlement. Here, here's the uh, check, go away. Friedrich's got some money out of it. Yeah. And nobody knows how much because no. it's a private settlement. No. But mm-hmm. So I would assume he was probably taken care of. He's like, here's your money. Shut up. But all the money that Marvel had made off Ghost Rider, yeah. you could throw him a, some checks. Yeah. You know, take care of him in his old age, especially if he's got Parkinson's. <coughs> yeah. And I would assume that part of that was also him giving up all rights to the character. Mm-hmm. Well, <laughs> That's a, well, it's the same deal they worked with Cochran. Yeah. Before he died, he signed a deal with Marvel, mm-hmm. basically giving up any and all rights he might have to the X-Men in lieu of them taking care of his medical bills. Yeah, they took care of his medical So when he died, the family couldn't come back at Marvel no, for money no. for uh, the X-Men. Because Dave Cockrum co-created uh, the current version of the X-Men Correct. with Len Wein yeah. back in Giant Size X-Men yeah. 1. Yeah. So Marvel agreed to take care of his medical bills. And I would assume that there was probably something like that here with Gary Friedrich. Mm-hmm. He probably, he probably got sicker uh, by the time the suit was over with and said, look, we'll take care of your medical bills, which had to be really, really big. 
And well, you had Parkinson's. Yeah, had Parkinson's disease, and, and basically his lawsuit. He's like, you're not going to win this lawsuit because you can't prove you created the character. Yeah, you were well, work for hire. Well, you weren't the only one that. Yeah, you were the, the only character. one involved. Yeah, you yeah. Were, you, could, you could say this is all mine. Yeah, it's not all yours. Roy Thomas and Mike Plug were there involved also. Yeah. And, of course, uh, Friedrich made the convention circuit in the last decade or so of his life, saying, yeah. hi, I'm the guy that created oh, Ghost yeah, he would, which, yeah. you can, which you can do. Yeah, you can I, do it. Yeah, I created Ghost Rider, yeah, everybody, created... and everybody who knew Ghost Rider knew who yeah, he was. Yeah, we knew who you are. Yeah, that would be like the thing behind him when he sat there, you know, created Ghost Rider. He popped up a couple times here. I remember walking by him, and, yeah, sign said you created Ghost Rider. If you are looking for some of Gary's other writings, you might want to check out Captain America 142, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, Daredevil 67, 70, 79, Frankenstein. We were talking about uh, Mike Plug. I didn't realize this. Gary Friedrich co wrote uh, Frankenstein, which would be the first handful of issues, which would have been the, um, the origin. The curse of Frankenstein. Yeah, the origin of the character. Of course, Ghost Rider. He did Hulk 102, 3, 4. Actually, he worked with Maurice Severn. On a lot of this early Hulk stuff. 102, 3, 4, 7, 44, 53, Iron Man, 45, 46, 49, 50, 51, 52. The Sergeant Furies, like I said, from 100 on to uh, went to reprint. Did some odd Justice League stuff, 86 through 99. I can tell you from my own experience, mm-hmm. if you read those, mm-hmm. They are terrible. They have every cliche you could possibly think of that a hippie from the late 60s will throw into a Justice League book. It is some of the worst writing you will ever read. I think very hard. I'm sorry, but it is. I remember them quite well for that. He wrote the early 70s Kazar series, the first five issues, and Star Reach. He did some Star Reach stuff, the the independent comic in the mid-70s. That's probably because he knew Mike Luna. He contributed some stories to that, 2, 3, 7, 8, and 10. He'll have stories in there, and Submariner 51 through 56. Mm -hmm. So be sure to check all those out. And uh, that's Gary Friedrich. We wish his family well. He is survived by his wife, Jean, Mm -hmm. and his daughter, Leslie, and nephew, Chris. We give them our condolences. Uh, That's going to do it. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to say goodbye. Located at the intersection of 111th and Kedzie in the heart of beautiful downtown Mount Greenwood, Alternate Reality is the only brick-and-mortar store that discounts all new comics, 15% 15% off every day for everyone, and that's been since 1994. And all brand new first issues are discounted at 25% off every new Comic Wednesday. So stop on down and save some money. And we're back. And until next time, be sure to stop off the store's website, myalternatereality.com, where you'll find all of Bo's news, all of JR's reviews, all of Vito Carly's reviews, all the things you'd ever want to know about shipping for the store, myalternatereality.com. And until next time, this is Comic Book Man hey. saying... Goodbye, ladies and gentlemen. Until next time, bye! Thanks a lot for listening. If you enjoyed this show, please like and share it with all your friends. We value your feedback, so drop us a question, comment, show idea, or complaint either at arcomics at msn.com or, if provided, in the comments section down below on this platform. The opinions expressed in this episode are solely those of the individuals and not necessarily those of Alternate Reality Incorporated. This show is, as always, coming to you from the Alternate Reality Comic Shop, located in the heart of beautiful downtown Mount Greenwood at the intersection of 111th and Kedzie, serving Chicago comics fandom since 1994. I'm out of here.